Thank you to Fatal Knockout for sponsoring this video. Learn how you can support the Kickstarter in the link in the description. Let's talk about weird fighting games. When I say the word fighting game, what do you think of? For the majority of you, it's probably two characters facing each other on a flat 2D plane with health bars at the top of the screen, a timer in between those health bars, some form of meter down at the bottom corners, and a pretty looking stage. Now, where people's thoughts begin to differ will be with how the game actually controls. However, the most common forms of controls are characters walk back and forth on the plane, but cannot move backwards in or out of the plane, or characters are able to move through the stage and around their opponent, but they aren't able to jump as much. These two types of games are generally considered common types of fighting games, being your traditional and your 3D fighting games. And we'll also just put anime games in here too while we're at it, because they can certainly be... unusual. There's nothing really about them that breaks too much from the standard conventions of the genre. But how weird can we go? How far can we push the genre's limits and still class the games we're playing as as fighting games? Well, that's what I'm gonna try and do. I'm going to go to the ends of the earth to find the weirdest and most obscure fighting games that I can. Fighting games that break and bend the rules as much as possible in order to find the most fringe of fringe case games. And I'm gonna take you with me. So without further ado, let's just start with something simple. Pocket Fighter, also known as Super Gem Fighter, is a 2D fighting game made by Capcom in 1997. It's a crossover game where you can play as characters from an array of different Capcom classic games. With IPs such as Street Fighter, Darkstalkers, and they even managed to fit one Red Earth character in there. Isn't that nice? I'm of course going to pick Ken because just like him, I am a family man who loves my family. Ken continues his training in America, but the honeymoon with Eliza has long since ended, and they've become a bit tired of each other lately. I love Eliza, but it would be kind of nice to have tea with another girl every once in a while. Ken, you're supposed to be a family man, what is this? And so, Ken left in search of a beautiful girl. Okay, so the story of the game is about how Ken is horny and wants to try and have tea with someone who isn't his wife. What an amazing family man. Must be why he's like this in Street Fighter 6. So Pocket Fighter kind of plays like your traditional fighting game in many ways. Both players have HP and super meters. When one player's HP bar is depleted, the other player wins the round. Two rounds to win the whole game? It's very traditional in that sense, but the game breaks away from the mold with its two standout features. Instead of basically every other Capcom fighting game, Pocket Fire has one punch and one kick button, as well as a special button which I like to call the funny button, because it makes funny things happen. Both your punches and your kicks lead to very basic auto combos that the characters can use. Depending on the combo, you can get different enders like a strike that is very punishable but can lead to an easy juggle, or a throw that can't be blocked but leaves you vulnerable when whiffed. Very basic strings, you know? The second thing is to do with the little gems which you've no doubt see fly across the screen like a poorly cooked meal during an airplane crash. These are the titular gems, and they increase one of the three bars at the bottom corners of the screen. These bars are tied to one of your special moves, and the more gems you get, the more experience is given to that special move. Get enough XP, and it'll level up, becoming a stronger version of itself. You can't lose any XP when you're getting hit, but if your opponent hits you enough, then you do generate gems to be picked up. The bigger the gem, the bigger the EXP bonus. It leads to this really interesting scramble situation where you want to pick up as many gems as you can in order to level up your special moves, but you need to be wary of what your opponent is doing. If they're a zoner, it might be best to try and keep the pressure on instead of going for more gems. Or if you see a really big gem on your opponent's side, it might be worth chasing them down and doing riskier things to try and get over them and get it. I'm making it sound complicated, but it's not any more complicated than your regular fighting game decisions, and the game is mostly just meant to be a bit of fun. There's a lot of hidden easter eggs with characters moves, the whole system of the game is meant to be charming and fun. Speaking of charming and fun, let's check on the debonair Ken Masters, shall we? Hey there, Morrigan. Interested in having a cup of tea with me sometime? Why not? The riz on this man! But first, how about a sparring match? I'm so dreadfully bored. I know. How about you buy me a pair of shoes if I win and a new outfit if I lose? Sure, that sounds... Hey, wait. The dumbass on this man. So Ken beats Morrigan, takes her on a date, Eliza finds out, and Morrigan laughs. And now you know all the important things about Ken's lore leading up to Street Fighter 6. Thank you for watching, everyone. I really like this game, but let's be honest, it's not too unusual for fighting games. You can still see all of the traditional 2D game routes inside of it. The movement's very traditional, the specials are very traditional. Hell, even the combo structure is something that will become more commonplace as the game's evolved. So how about we dive a little deeper and try to find something that really kicks the conventions of the genre to the curb. 
Dive Kick is a fighting game that came out in 2013. Dive Kick is somewhat of a parody of fighting game culture and fighting games of the time. Everything has a tongue-in-cheek feel to it, from the titular characters being literally named Dive and Kick, to the fraud detection system where if you beat the other player without dropping a single game, they get listed as a fraud, to even literally having actual FGC figures in the game be playable with references to them as people. Jubaley's head grows every time you win a match to the point where I think he's going to pop like a balloon if this keeps happening. Now, Dive Kick is a very complex game to understand and play. It takes at least a decade for anyone to be able to understand the complexity and the depth of this game, which is why I'm talking about it 10 years after it came out. The game has two buttons that control everything. One makes you dive, and the other makes you kick. How did they come up with this? The goal of the game is to simply hit the opponent with a dive kick before they hit you with their own. Each character has a different trajectory at which they dive kick, so it's important to try and predict where your opponent is going to be before you commit to a dive kick. The characters also all have their own gimmicks that they can use, with special abilities and super moves that they get once they've filled up their shoe meter. Now, you might be wondering, how do you walk around in the game and play neutral? And that's the best part. You don't. Yippee! You move entirely by hopping around and dive kicking. The game focuses on neutral and whiff punishing by having you light up your attacks to hit the opponent when they're vulnerable on the screen, or trying to bait your opponent to think that you're vulnerable, and then hit them with a counterattack. It's got the building blocks of fighting game neutral, but presents them in a unique way, which can make it a little bit easier to understand for some people, but I'm not sure it's for everyone. I do personally really like it though, and I think it's just fucking funny, like, he, he just floats away, he's gone, he's fucking gone. But come on, Gecko, this is still tame. This ain't that outlandish, like, there's still basic concepts of fighting game. Where's the really weird stuff, dude? Like, come on, give it to me, show me the crazy things. Alright, fine, what if we took the video game out of the fighting game then, huh? This is Fatal Knockout. It's a board game that is heavily inspired by fighting games and is also the sponsor of today's video. Thank you, Fatal Knockout. Just so you know that even though they are sponsoring this video and allow me to playtest that game early, all of the words I'm about to say are my own, and they did not pay me to give them praise. The game is one versus one, and the goal is to hit your opponent five times before they hit you. At the start of every game, you must decide which player is the leader. The leader switches every other turn, so it doesn't matter too much who gets the roll first. Players then draw three cards from their draw pile. The leader must then play a card face up in front of the game board. The other player then must also play a card faced upwards. The leader then can choose to place another card face down, or they can choose to end the turn. If the leader places another card, the other player has to play another card. Once the leader says the turn is over, or both players have played all of their available cards, combat starts. Each card has an initiative number at the top left. The players must order the cards from the lowest to the highest initiative order. The card order then shows the sequence of events that play out. The cards are very easy to understand and read, with some of them giving you choices of actions that you're able to do, so you have some options of the outcome of the turn while it's happening. For instance, let's say that you place some cards down with the plan to rush into your opponent's striking range, hit them, and then back away. But because of the way that the turn order is working, it would cause you to take more damage than you would actually deal to them. Depending on the cards that you play, you might be able to turn that rush into a runaway strategy so that you can avoid your opponent's damage and wait for a better moment to strike. Once the turn is over, the other player is now the leader. Both players draw three more cards from their draw pile, and the match continues. That's the basics of the game, but the death starts to come from the characters that you can pick and how you play them. The base game comes with six separate characters. Cage the Grappler. The simplest of the characters in the game, hey, don't look at me, that's what the devs said. Cage is a big, slow guy who wants nothing more than to give you a nice big hug and do absolutely ludicrous amounts of damage. He's recommended for players who are brand new to Fatal Knockout and fighting games in general, or just players who like the big slow guy. Mercury the Rushdown. Get in, do damage, and get out in the blink of an eye. Mercury is a high mobile character that is able to move around the board at breakneck pace, and drag her higher initiative cards down the chain to give her better setups. When I got to playtest the game with the devs, she was the character that I played, and I absolutely loved her. She is 
so mobile, great for players with monkey brains like myself. V, the Zona. Armed with her trusty staff, V is able to control the battlefield from afar, with far hitting moves and disjointed hitboxes. Some of her cards allow her to move her staff independently from herself, so she can attack her enemies while being nowhere near them. Sounds like an absolute menace to fight, a great pick if you're somebody who loves killing your enemies from afar. Zero, the Stance. A unique take on the all-rounder character, Zero is able to switch between three different coloured stances that allow them to alternate how their attacks work. Having a close-hitting stance, a far-hitting stance, and a stance focused around movement, you can absolutely style on your opponent with Zero if you get the hang of them. I absolutely love to see unique stance characters in fighting games, so seeing them use this instead of a generic show is actually something I can respect. Spur, the Gunslinger. The Gunslinger does the classic maneuver of bringing a firearm to a martial arts competition. With a maximum of three bullets in their chamber, Spur is able to attack his enemies from a safe distance with powerful gunshots. He also has access to different bullets that modify the amount of damage that he deals. Just make sure to be in a safe place when you have to reload. Axel, the Guitarist. Being quite possibly one of the most complicated characters I've ever seen, Axel uses the power of music as his weapon. When he attacks, he chooses a specific note to attack with. Each note is a different action entirely depending on its color. He then at some point has the option to play a chorus, which takes the three previous notes that he used and has him perform a mega attack. This can be a very far reaching attack, a very high damaging attack right in front of him, or ridiculous movement, or other things that I'll let you discover. The best thing I can compare him to is the hunting horn from Monster Hunter. A marvel to watch, but absolutely ridiculous to play. Fatal Knockout manages to prove that fighting games don't have to exist just purely as video games, and the heart of them can be found in other mediums as well. And the best part of it is, the game isn't even fully out yet. In the description, there is a link to the Kickstarter page in which the developers are trying to get the game funded. The base game costs about £34 or about 41 US dollars, and comes with all the characters that I have listed, as well as two AI characters and the playing board. If you pledge £54 or 65 US dollars, you also get the Oddity expansion, which includes four more playable characters, two of which I was able to get a sneak peek at. One of them is a squirrel, and I love him so much, and the other two are to be announced soon. If that's a bit too pricey for you though, there is an £8 tier in which you get a print and play version of the game, so you can experience the game itself on a much cheaper budget. Still not convinced? Well, the developers have released the entire game so far for free on Tabletop Simulator, so you can try the game with some friends before you even pledge a single penny. I highly, highly recommend that you go and check out this game if you think it sounds cool, and pledge to the Kickstarter if you're able to. Thank you, Fatal Knockout, for the sponsorship. You guys are awesome. You all knew this one was coming, didn't you? Your Only Move is Hustle is a task-based, turn-based fighting game released officially on Steam in February 2023. The game picked up a large amount of traction before the Steam released and exploded in popularity once you were able to actually buy the game. The base game lets you play as four characters. Ninja, who is your rushdown ninja archetype. Robot, who is the dedicated grappler. Wizard, who is your dedicated zoner and also a piece of shit. And Cowboy, who was inspiration from somewhere, but I can't quite put my finger on it. The game works in a pretty simple way. Both players are able to choose an action for their character. When both players confirm their action, the game plays out until either player is able to act again. Players then take their turns acting and reacting to each other in order to try and hit their opponent as much as possible. You have 30 minutes in total to make all of your moves, so if you're not sure what you want to do, you can give it some thought. This can also mean that competitive matches can go on for a really long time. Now you see, your only move is hustle gameplay either looks like this... Or it looks like this. And since I haven't played this game that much, you're gonna have to look at the most boring footage, I'm afraid. The whole game revolves around predicting what your opponent is going to do next. While playing, you're able to choose the options that your opponent might do on their side of the screen, as well as the options that you can do, and you'll see little ghost versions of the characters performing those actions. So you can see ahead of time of what the results of those actions will actually be. It basically visualizes what goes on in a good fighting game player's head when they have time to take a breather. You have as much time as you need to figure out the optimal response to your opponent's moves. Now, here's where the tricky part comes in. There's generally a pretty optimal answer for every situation. Some move that you can do stuffs out most of your opponent's moves. 
in any other fighting game, this would generally be your go-to move with no thought attached to it. And even in this game, it's a pretty good option and a pretty safe bet. But the question becomes, will your opponent counteract your best option with one of the options that beat that option? Which of those will they choose? Do you try to counter that option? Is it worth it? This is where the hook of the game lies in trying to correctly predict what it is that your opponent will do and counteract them before they can pull off their game plan. And the feeling when you actually pull it off is unlike anything any other game can provide. This is actually a situation that comes up a lot in traditional fighting games, but it generally takes a while to get there. You have to get a good grasp of the fundamentals and your character's gimmicks, as well as the opponent playstyle and habits, before you can make hard reads and do crazy outplays, and it can take hundreds if not thousands of hours to get to that point. Your only move is Hustle gets you to that point basically immediately. Once you figure out how the game works and what you can do, you'll get to the reading your opponent part before you know it, and giving players that feeling as soon as possible is an absolute miracle that not many other fighting games have managed to pull off yet. Something I also really like is the fact that you can just mod the game a bunch thanks to the workshop. There's character customization, so you can change your character to look how you want, and it actually causes the custom character to show up on other players' games when fighting them. The workshop also has a bunch of retexturing that's client-side, unfortunately, and even new characters that the community has made. My friend Nevis put a mod pack together with a bunch of characters for when our friend group plays, and there's a couple of standouts there. We got a slime, Fox McCloud, a bunny rabbit, apparently, an umbrella person, and whoa! <laughs> Having modding capabilities like this is always a great sign to see in any game, let alone indie fighting games, and I can't wait to see all the stuff the community and the developers come up with for new characters and features. I'm pretty sure there's a map feature that somebody has added which looks absolutely amazing. If you're looking for something that takes mechanical complexity out of fighting games and doubles, triples, and quadruple down on the mind game aspects of the genre, then there aren't many better options than your only move is hot. Hustle. But Gecko, I hear you crying out at your monitor. All of the examples you've given us simply remove executional complexity from these games and allow you to get to the mind games of finding games sooner. I want something that keeps the execution. All right, all right. Well, hey, I got a question for you. Do you like air hockey? Round one. Wind Jammers is an old Neo Geo arcade game made in 1994 by Data East, who I've never heard of before and aren't around anymore, so that's probably why I don't know anything about them. There was a sequel released in 2021 made by .emu that has a bunch of new features, better controls and better graphics, but it cost £15 and they took it off the Xbox Game Pass, so... We're gonna be talking about the original that's on Fightcade for this video. Wind Jammers is a pretty simple game. The goal is to get your frisbee into the opponent's goal. Goals are worth either 3 or 5 points depending on where they land, with the yellow goals representing 3-point zones, and the red goals representing 5-point zones. First player to get to 12 points, or the player that has the most points after the timer runs out, wins the round. You have to win 2 rounds to win the set. The game is very simple from the outlook, and it's pretty simple when you're learning the basics. However, once you start focusing, the complexities of the game make themselves known very quickly. The way that you throw the disc back changes depending on which direction you're holding the stick. You can also curve the shot by doing a half circle input before throwing the disc. If you throw the disc back as soon as you get it, you throw it faster, and the speed slowly fades the longer that you hold it. You can dash by pressing a direction and the A button, but if you hold it, you'll actually block, which can call the disc to bounce upwards when hitting you. You can then charge up a super attack that throws the disc back at your enemy really fast. You can lob the disc to make it fall upwards, and if the enemy doesn't catch it in time, then you get two points for the disc just falling. All characters in the roster have their own unique super shots, as well as different speeds and strengths that they can throw the disc at. So character choice can matter quite a bit depending on what you're looking for. The game is really fun, and it gets extremely fast as well. Trying to input curve shots and set up for power shots while the disc is flying about can be a frantic yet fun experience. Even when you lose, it feels like you just want to get back in and keep playing to get your shot at revenge. There isn't much else to say though, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's a simple old arcade game. Well, apart from the fact that the loading screen is determined to give you an epileptic fit. Is it really the weirdest fighting game though? Is it the most unusual? No. And that's because I've been saving the actual answer for dead last. The weirdest, most unusual fighting game that there is has been staring you in the face the whole time. Ladies, gentlemen, and others, the weirdest fighting game is... Tetris. I will not be elaborating. See you next week. As always, a very special thanks to 64 MHz, Almost Naptime, Brudakai, Daniel Wiederick, Dragon Prox, Games.png, I am Naoto, Lady Dantelon, Melodically Me, 
Monact N. Hoa, Ray W., Super, Tom Tanks, William Gagnon, and Zandatsu for being Tier 2 Patron supporters. <laughs>